is up the, the turning point for ships making the difficult passage through the Straits of Mackinac, one of the busiest crossroads of the Great Lakes. The bridge is an engineering marvel. Oh boy, look at the uh, lighthouse guy. Uh, now, the story of Old Mackinac Point Lighthouse. You're going know, to keep driving a Model T when you get something nicer. So, now, uh, uh, our whistle blast, our whistle uh, signal pattern in the 1890s was a five second blast on the whistle, 17 seconds of silence, a five second blast on the whistle, 32 seconds of silence, and then I'm going to blow a third five second blast on the whistle. Now that is a very complicated way of saying that I'm, it, our signal was two toots per minute. Um, the third one is to kick over the compressor um, so it'll actually charge up for the next demonstration. Yeah, if they want me to blow a full of steam whistle, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I like this. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is a foghorn. It's loud. If you wish to cover your ears, you may want to. But it's not going to break your glasses like it does in the, in the cartoons. So. Fifteen seconds here. Sound in the fog horn! Sound in the fog horn! Okay, in five, four, three, two, one. Plush. Pump organ. Uh, I guess that's a wood stove, or maybe it's a coal stove. A dining room. And we just saw the sitting room. And the keeper's kitchen, the place you want to be in the winter time. Because that stove would heat the place up and make it smell so good.
paraphernalia from Rex, I suppose. The Coast Guard took it over in 1939 and changed the uniform. Captains in the pilot house. The chart on the rail before you shows the unique light signatures of the Straits of Mackinac. Oh, let's see what's over here. There it is. Yeah, the picture. This operated from 1911 to 1984, 12 months a year, 24 hours a day. Wow. I hope this doesn't turn into a death spiral. Oh, look at this big rig here. The Cedarville, 1965. And that was a big one. It collided with another ship, a German freighter, Wiesenberg. Departures in the eight month navigation season. The majority of the vessels traversing the lakes pass through the Straits of Mackinac. Its importance and danger is shown by the fact that the second lighthouse on Lake Huron was built on Oblo Island in 1829, and the first lightship on the Great Lakes was stationed at the western end of the Straits at Waggishots Shoal in 1832. By 1900, a dozen lighthouses were located throughout the region. 
Although lighthouses could not ensure safe passage, these aids to navigation gradually improved safety conditions, as did other forms of technology, including ship construction, radio communication, and radar. Most of the wrecks in the Straits occurred before 1890 and were older, wooden-hulled sailing vessels. Nearly half were caused by being driven into a reef or shore, with the remainder occurring due to collisions or ice damage. Over half occurred in the fall, most of the others in the spring. Most were downbound, traveling from the west. The western entrance is the most dangerous part of the Straits, due to the lack of safe harbor for a ship in distress. Often the wreck was a combination of several factors, including bad weather, bad timing, bad luck, and bad judgment. This is illustrated by four famous Straits of Mackinac wrecks. Prior to 1860, many ships on the Great Lakes were brigs. Brigs had two masts with square sails. Although prized for their speed, they were less maneuverable than a schooner rigged vessel, a distinct disadvantage on the Great Lakes. The constricted Straits of Mackinac could be especially hazardous to a brig. One that failed this challenge was the Sandusky. Today, the Sandusky rests 80 feet beneath the surface five miles west of Old Mackinac Point. On September 16, 1856, the eight-year-old brig departed Chicago with a cargo of grain and a crew of seven. Two days later, the Sandusky found northern Lake Michigan in the grip of a powerful storm and was thrown out of control in heavy winds. The crew manned the bilge pump, the last hope for keeping the Sandusky afloat as she took on water and began sinking. Alerted to her plight, the side-wheeler Queen City set out from Mackinac Island to attempt a rescue. When they arrived on the scene, they found the ship sunk, with three sailors clinging to the spar. In the face of gale force winds, the captain of the Queen City could not maneuver his ship close enough to save the three men. They were ultimately abandoned to the same fate as their four fellow crew members. In Lake Huron, five miles from Old Mackinac Point, lies the William H. Barnum. The wood-hulled steamer is upright and mostly intact. At the time of her sinking, she was in poor condition, scheduled for major repairs. With 55,000 bushels of wheat, the Barnum left Chicago on April 1, 1894, the first day of the shipping season. Two days later, she was the first of the fleet to reach the Straits. Here, the Barnum encountered heavy weather and extensive ice flows. The poor condition of the vessel was no match for the choppy water and battering ice. Her seams opened up and water poured in. The pumps fell behind as she passed Mackinac City, and the Barnum sounded the distress call on her whistle. Answering, the tub crusader attempted to beach her, with ice blocking the shore, it proved impossible, and the crew was soon evacuated. Both crews watched from the deck of the tug as the Barnum sank to the bottom of the straits. Four and a half miles west of Old Mackinac Point rests the Eber Ward, a wood-hulled steamer. Now beneath the murky waves, she sank on a clear and calm April day in 1909. Two days before, she had been loaded with grain in Milwaukee. Her steam engines brought her toward the Straits. Six miles west of Mackinac City lay what appeared to be a slushy flow of windrow ice, a final remnant of the passing winter. It was judged no danger when the captain moved the Eber Ward forward, intending to easily pass through it. The judgment proved wrong. As the ship entered the ice flow, the timbers of the bridge shook and twisted. The ice flow was solid ice and cut two large holes in the wooden bow. The Eber Ward filled with chilly water, which quickly flowed up the deck. Within ten minutes of impact, the ship sank, carrying five men with it.
May 7, 1965, found the Straits of Mackinac shrouded in a dense fog. Fog signals were sounding from the Mackinac Bridge, and east and westbound ships were moving blind into the Straits. One of these, under the command of Captain Martin Jopik, was the westbound Cedarville, an aging 588-foot freighter loaded with limestone from calcite near Rogers City to Gary, Indiana. Despite the fog, the Cedarville, following U.S. Steel Company policy, was moving at full speed. Ahead of her was the American ship Steinbrenner. Three miles east of the bridge, visibility dropped to less than 1,000 feet as the Cedarville made radio contact with the German vessel Weisenberg approaching from the west. A port-to-port -port passage was arranged. However, the Weisenberg reported to the Cedarville that there was a Norwegian vessel ahead of her, also heading east. The Steinbrenner confirmed that they had just passed this Norwegian ship, the Topdalsfjord, and warned that she was not answering radio calls. Under these conditions, Jopik should have taken evasive action. However, he only reduced speed slightly, did not properly signal, and ordered erratic course changes. Cedarville and Topdalsfjord were bound for a collision. Tension mounted on the bridge as the reality of the situation set in. As the two ships appeared to each other out of the fog, Captain Jopik ordered a turn in a desperate attempt to clear the vessel. Unfortunately, this only provided a wider target. Next thing there, there she's coming. Out of the fog, guys. Cook was at the rear, and he says, she's captain, she's cruising in on us. I look good, man. 45 degrees off the poor dog. I can see the bow coming out of the fog. That's the way we hit it. Well, we are hard as left to try to swing around too late, you know. We would have been earlier, maybe, you know. Or if you had the distance, it might have been done. Entrance to the visitor center, right under the bridge. You hear the rumble above. 57 Chevy, red two-door coupe with a white top, and a 55 Chevy, four-door, two-tone. The bad thing about this little town, it's really neat little houses and everything, but you have that incessant noise of the interstate and the bridge. It's a River Rock house. Look at the quaint little garage. I think it's made for a Model T. Well, here it is, the modern economy, tourism. What happened to the trees? Where, where are the tall shade trees at? Look at these little short, scrawny ones. I can't take too much of this. It's time to cross the bridge and go to the Uper. Here it is, the ferry gateway to the Mackinac Island.